Hi, uh, I'm starting a new sub-series that I'm going to call Quantum Bible. Let me adjust the sound. There. I'm calling it Quantum Bible. Now, I'm going to have to define what that is. There's this thing called quantum physics. And the name sounds really intimidating and all that. But all it means is the measurements, like this is a sentence, okay? And this is a letter, it's the Greek letter N. How does that N relate to the rest of the sentence? That's all quantum physics is. It's looking at pieces of things in our universe and trying to figure out how they relate to each other, which is really no different than putting together a sentence. Now, this sentence is in Greek. If you grew up learning Greek, this wouldn't be hard for you at all. But if you didn't, then even learning that this, it looks like a V to an English speaking person, but it's an N. Just learning that much is kind of taxing to the brain, okay? It's the same thing with quantum physics, it's just vocabulary. Once you understand the vocabulary, then it's really pretty simple things move. That's basically the story. Everything moves and everything's made out of little tiny bits. And quanta means to measure. Measure the bits. Like that's a letter. Okay? That's the letter N in Greek. Well, what does the letter N mean? Well, it depends on how it's used. Same thing in quantum physics. Same thing in quantum Bible. How that's a K. We can recognize that. That's not so hard. K-A-I. And ancient languages always had short vowels first. So it's A-I. So it's Ka-A-I. Kai. Alright? Now, Kai is the first syllable in Kaiser. Like in Caesar which is spelled K-A-I-S-A-R in Greek. Now that matters because one of the things that you can do with words or numbers or anything else is you can make witty things out of them. So, here's a letter. How is it used? Here's a particle in physics and there's actually a particle in physics with that same letter name. It's called a neutrino. Well, how is it used? Alright, same thing in Bible. So we're going to call this Quantum Bible. Now that makes it sound fancy and scientific and all that. Well, I submit to you this is harder than quantum physics. I didn't spend much time learning physics, but over the last couple of weeks I did. And it's not hard compared to this. The only thing that's hard is the vocabulary. The only thing that's hard about this Bible is this vocabulary. So, I'm going to describe the structure so that you can see how beautiful this is. Because physics is beautiful too. But if these letters being unfamiliar to you throw you off, go grab your translation. Just put this video on hold. Pause it and go grab a translation so that you can see Revelation 17 in your favorite language. Because I have to use the original in order to do these syllable counts. And the, the counts matter. Just like in quantum physics, it's the counting that matters in order for you to determine the relationship of each piece within a whole. Okay, here's a whole clause. How does each letter relate? How does each word relate? How does each phrase relate? That's all it is. Pieces of a whole. So go grab your favorite translation. Put me on pause. Okay. Ready? Now, this is Revelation 17, one of the most famous, famous chapters of the Bible. Everybody knows it. Nobody knows it. All at the same time. Now, seven years ago, this technique I'm going to show you, I first learned in the New Testament in Ephesians 1. 
and in particular what I learned was is that when you have repetitions of words like this here is the whore that's what it means in English the great whore all right and it's a nasty word and it's meant to be nasty I'm not going to sugarcoat it harlot is a nicer word for it I suppose when words are repeated in a measured fashion you know it's like count one count two count three word count one count two count three word you see the there's a rhythm to that okay there's also a significance to it because it makes it easier for you to remember but here in our quantum Bible it's telling you something about history this whole purpose of this chapter is to tell you about future history and everybody thinks oh it's about the tribulation well yeah but that's not its primary purpose its primary purpose is to tell you why the tribulation why not what the what's are covered but there's the purpose of them is to tell you why same thing in physics what what's the, what's the role of a neutrino why is there one okay what's Bible prophecy why do we have it all right one of the reasons we have it is that you're always supposed to know what time it is not for the purpose of drooling over the rapture but so that when you have to plan like ahead where are you gonna go next year what are you gonna do tomorrow okay this is telling you where history goes and if you're in an area that this is gonna cover and that's gonna go bad then you're gonna want to get out of wherever you are if where you are is bad you'd want to know and if the area that you're in is going to be good well wouldn't you want to know that too now one of the things that's sort of odd about prophecy is that we all drool over it because we have this interest in learning the future but think about the truth of that if God came to you in a dream and you could be sure it was him and not the demon boys who like to give us dreams too and he told you you were gonna die in 15 years get your house in order that's not good news to you that's something you kind of wish you didn't know then you wake up every day for the next 15 years and you know your time is gonna end then now God did that he did it to Hezekiah that's uh, somewhere around um, Isaiah 35 or so 35 36 somewhere in there okay first Isaiah comes to Hezekiah and says hi you're gonna die now get your house in order and then Hezekiah prayed and God said to Hezekiah okay you got 15 more years to go and he was childless at the time Three years later, he has a son, Manasseh, who turned out to be one of the worst kings Israel ever had until he repented. Okay? So, knowing the future, we want it and we don't want it. We like playing with it like a toy. But when it comes too close, we don't like it at all. And I'm no different from anybody else. Actually, I don't, I hate prophecy. And that's one of the reasons I have to do it, because I hate it. Okay, that's a long story and it's personal and you don't want to hear that right now. So quantum Bible is the way to, how do I want to put it, get a precise reading on the prophecy that everybody used to know. And somewhere after the first century we lost this ability to know what this syllable counting was. And at the same time it takes away some of the sting when you get answers that largely speaking are not happy answers about the future okay because it's so precise and it's mathematical in a way um, you're so busy trying to just figure out what it is and then because of this precision you know exactly what it is and your shock is somewhat bigger 
but at the same time it's somewhat more dispassionate so you can deal with it okay that's what this is really designed to do now this is history of the future year by year and technically speaking this first word Chi is 88 AD okay it's actually the end of 88 AD okay and therefore the end of Revelation 17 is going to end up ending at 956 AD why inquiring minds want to know notice it's not a thousand it's not some number that we would expect why is it ending there and, and why and how do you know it's 88 AD well I covered why we know it's 88 AD in the Revelation 1 videos I'm gonna have to redo them because there are additional reasons why we know that which I didn't cover before but it doesn't kind of matter because you can know the same thing because each chapter has its own way of stating when it was written because a guy could write a chapter and then put it down for a while and then write another chapter okay so for example this 56 the first time text sevens the whole sum total of all the syllables are divisible by seven the first time that happens that's called a date line that's true from Genesis through Revelation they have the same the same uh, style the first date line okay well 56 is the most common date line used in the Bible probably the most common I haven't found one more common and the easiest way to understand that is the 56th year after Christ died at age 33 now I have to head this off at the pass the reason we have that 4 BC birthday to Christ problem is not the reason that everybody's telling you it doesn't have anything to do with Dionysius um, or exiguous I think his last name is has nothing to do with him it has to do with the fact that in the year that Christ was born they were debating what was the age of Rome Livy was saying that Rome was 750 years old and a guy named Varro was saying that Rome was 753 years old and Augustus had to pick between the two and he liked Varro well Varro was wrong Livy was right so the actual year that Christ was born was the 750th year that Rome lived but they called it the 753rd year that Rome lived so that's why there's a three year difference it's really that simple it took me like five years of research to figure that out and most scholars don't know that till this day they, they've never figured it out and that's because all of our modern scholars always base all the AC and BC dates on what they consider to be the age of Rome and they're using Varro and they're using Varro's 753 year old at the time Christ was born because Augustus liked it and because it became law to use Varro for the age of Rome in the time of Claudius now that makes a difference when you're gonna go look at Bible books and what their what their dates are you have to adjust back and forth between the real date of 750 and Varro's date and the Bible writers all do that so here we're seeing an adjustment 56th year after Christ died at age 33 and he's doing it that way because then that way you don't have to deal with whether it's Varro or not just go by Christ's age so they're using their own Anno Domini here all the anti Bible writers use an Anno Domini sometimes it's just like ours like when Paul did it in Ephesians 1 sometimes it's using Livy and you have to keep on going back and forth and you have to know that so we know okay if it's the 56th year that means 55 years have passed the 56th year has not completed Christ was 33 when he died everybody knows that so it's 88 and it's actually at the end of 88 AD okay so 
if you know that, then you're seeing this first syllable. That's 88. You get here 10. That's 10 years after 88. That's 98 AD. Now John in particular likes to play with numbers that aren't divisible by 7. And he does that in all of his letters. So he's saying, hi, I wrote you 10 years ago from the last time, from the time I'm writing now. Okay, I, well, I wrote you 10 years after the temple fell, and I'm now writing you the ninth year later. See how that works? That works out to be for Kislev 88 AD. Okay, and that link is to take you to the Ephesians piece because it helps you know what time was like then. Because he wasn't, he was exiled by some local magistrate because Domitian was in Rome. John is on Patmos. The mission didn't have anything to do with Patmos. Patmos is over near Turkey. Okay? So somebody, the mission in Rome was all upset about, you know, getting rid of Jews in Rome. Okay? And that's very important in Revelation 1, but this is 17. Domitian was trying to get rid of Jews in his own family in Rome. There were too much, too many people converting to Judaism. And probably Christianity, too, because they used to call Christians Jews and Jews Christians. They couldn't tell the difference. So somebody near John denounced John as this Jew or Christian, and then some magistrate exiled him in order to, you know, make nice with the mission, thinking he'd make nice with the mission. I don't know if the mission ever even knew about this. All right? So that's the kind of time he's writing about when he starts. Now, in Revelation 17, we're well into the book. It's all the same year, though. It might not be for Kislev, because this is all, I, I don't have the precision of knowing what day, but it's still the same year because of this. Okay? Now, And the seventh angel came up to me, basically. All right? One of them having the seven vials from among the ones that had the seven vials. So what does that mean? Ten years from now, something that plays on the seventh angel is going to be relevant to the people who are getting this letter. What is that? I don't know. I haven't investigated it. Usually you can find the answer. But I wasn't interested in finding it right now. Okay? And then this whole thing about among the ones that are having the seven vials. Because each, each one had a vial. V-I-A-L in English. Okay? That would be a total of 19 years after John writes. So about roughly 20 years is going to be something that's wittily and sarcastically related to vials. And in the first 10 years, at the end of 10 years, it's going to be something that's related to messengers. Okay, well it's not really all that hard to figure out what that is. See, because this is 88, 10 years later is Nerva. Okay. You can call that a messenger. There'd be messengers running all over the place saying, Hi, Nerva's in power now. He, well, actually, he just died. Nerva dies in 98 AD. So there'd be all kinds of messengers running around. I'm not so sure that that's the main intent of, of the 10 here, but it, that was just what hit my head while I was talking. Okay, 20 years from 88. So that goes to 98 to 108. And what's going on in 108? Well, that's Trajan. Okay? And vials. Maybe somebody tried to poison him. I mean, I have to go look it up. One of the things I want you to understand is that this is meant to be witty and memorable. The people who were alive then, just like we drool over the rapture, they'd be looking at this and saying, Okay, well, what, it's, it's 20 years now. What does it have to do with vials? And they would know. There would be something going on in world affairs that would make this really obvious and witty and informative so they know how to handle themselves at that time. 
okay that's what this is for it's an annual tracking mechanism so you know what to do with your life in light of what's upcoming and usually you know it's like a 10-year window sometimes it's so obvious that you don't need, you you don't you know you a longer window is fine but sometimes I mean you know, vials what's so important about that 108 AD okay maybe as you're coming up to 108 AD it becomes obvious but you know in in 98 AD uh, this might not have any relevance okay that's the first use of prophecy quantum Bible is for you to know where God wants you to be based on a big macro picture okay kinda like here you are on planet Earth but there's all these galaxies and galaxies and galaxies and galaxies around you okay so that's you in a context of the whole universe alright but here in your room in your bathroom or kitchen you can't see the whole universe and it doesn't seem relevant okay so don't you wouldn't it be nice to have a little guide to remind you hi get out of town something vile is gonna happen and you start to know that just before you're hitting that word in time see that's quantum that's a measured see it's measuring it's measuring time using words connected to the syllable counts they interact with each other just like mass and energy in physics mass is one side of it physic of uh, you know energy is the other side of it so which do you want to call mass do you want to call the words mass and the numbers energy okay take your pick because there are two sides of a coin in physics and there are two sides of a coin here this is how you relate the text to your life in time now next year 19 years from now 29 years from now la 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 okay now it's telling another story besides that one but for you in the present that's the story you need to know first so that's what these numbers are here to help you do. You're memorizing the text because it's God, God's word and you know something about it, but it's a lot to learn. And so you're memorizing it. At the same time, it's helping you know what time it is for you now. For you coming 19 years from now. For your kids coming 19 years from now. But just like quantum physics, which a lot of little pieces in a local place, well, the, the same kind of issues apply to big pieces like history between nations, what they're going to do, and in particular, you know, why is the tribulation going to happen? That's what Revelation 17 helps you know more than any other chapter. Why does the tribulation occur? And this is a map of human nature, of human psychology trying to revive Rome, which we have as our current problem in the United States today with the Christians behind Trump and in Russia today with the Christians behind Putin. It's a very real problem that we got now. So why is it a problem? What kind of problem is it? How long has it been going on? What does the past teach us about the present? That's what this is for. Now that's all macro level, like planets moving around the sun or in galaxies, right? So, one of the first things you do is you map out, like I said, what's 10 years from now, 19 years from now, now being 88 AD, 29, 37, and you have to keep adding 88 AD to these numbers because that's when John writes. Okay, when you do that, you just, you know, it's like, okay, 88 plus 10 is 98. What is that? Well, the first thing came to my mind was the death of Nerva, the em Roman Emperor Nerva, who ruled from 96 to 98. Well, what was the impact of that? What was the historical meaning of that? And then you play with the text which is, you know, 10 years, up to 10 years prior from Domitian to Nerva. What does that tell you? 
okay and then you you play with it and you can be washing the dishes you know you memorize a little clause and the angel the, the one of the seven angels came up to me what does that have to do with the mission to Nerva and you play with it and that means you have to go back and look at that history and sooner or later you start putting pieces together okay the same thing here 20 years from now what does that have to do with one of the ones having the seven vials he had one of the seven okay well what does that relate to and now we're talking 108 AD and now we're talking about Trajan okay and so on so each little segment has text that covers a certain future segment which we now call history so that's how come I know what this reference is because I'm looking backwards at it because you learn from history and you learn from prophecy prophecy is just history that hasn't happened yet and that's how God presents it in the Bible okay so that's the first thing so you're using it first of all to know where you should be and second of all to know where history is going to go and ideally thirdly you use it because that helps you understand God better why is he telling you this story what does that tell you about him what does this text tell you about God now there are answers to all those questions but I want you to ask God about them because that way you'll get sort of like hands-on experience on how to use this text okay so you can use your English or whatever your native translation and just like maybe get an interlinear so you know what words are covered in this clause and then talk to God about okay that's ten syllables in Greek it might be different number of syllables in your language but pretend it's still ten was that what does that clause tell you about God, about where you should have been if you were alive then, and about history? Now, quanta, quantum physics, are little pieces that fit together, and you have to have lots and lots and lots of pieces. Lots of letters fitting together in words. Lots of words fitting together in a clause. Lots of clauses fitting together in a sentence or two or three or five or ten. And once you get a bunch of them, oh, I see. Right? First you learned your ABCs, then you learned C dick run, C spot run, and then you started learning more complex sentences. Remember diagramming sentences? Maybe they don't do that anymore. They used to do that in the 1950s. And then, and then you can you can have complex thought, and you can see how one piece relates to another piece relates to another piece, and it sounds really complicated, but as you start to understand it, it's very rewarding, and the mo the biggest payoff to me is that you see God. So, that's what you do with these numbers. Now, once you go through this long analyzing of all these numbers and all these things that are happening at all these given dates and time okay that I've already mapped out but you'll see other things besides what I wrote because you can never say enough then the question is okay fine you've given me lots of facts about the future God and I can tell based on where I am if I was living right here at the time of Antoninus Pius Oh boy, it's going to turn it on. Okay. If I was living at the time of Antoninus Pius, this would be really relevant to know that that there's going to be a, you know, when it's talking about the drunkenness, getting drunk with all the inhabitants of the world. Okay. That's not, that doesn't sound too good, does it? So whatever it is, I don't think I want to be in Rome then because you would you would be seeing this stuff starting to happen if you were at the beginning as it were in time. Okay? Let's say it was it was uh, 156 AD. And now you're coming into this and you're trying to figure out, ooh, being drunk with all the inhabitants of the earth, that doesn't sound too good. Maybe I want to leave. 
Yeah, maybe you should. You see? So that tells you geographical will of God for you. That also tells you something about where history is going to go. And that tells you about God because he would bother to warn you. But it tells you something else. It tells you why the rapture. It tells you why the tribulation. But in order to see those whys, you got to go through all this data. And so the question naturally becomes, is there an easier way? To understand, you know, how do I how do I sort out all these facts and numbers and stuff? Quantum physics tries to decide the same thing, by the way. So here's the mechanism, and I learned it seven years ago. And I've talked about it before. It's the anaphoric center. Now, this is strictly mechanical. Okay? You first try to figure out what the anaphora are. What are the repeated words? Here's whore. Okay. And it's synonym for whore is woman. So you count that one. And that one is the same. And this is the word for seeing. And this is the word for beast. And you see these words repeated over and over. Okay. So first thing you got to do. And it's very mundane. Yeah. Map them. Okay, here's the word for whore. Here's the next word for woman. It's like a whore. Da -da, that's beast. Da -da, you know, you know. It's, it's like putting together a jigsaw puzzle. And then you count. This is really simple. How many times was the word whore or woman, which is a synonym for whore in this chapter, used? How many times? One, two, three. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. It's used ten times. Okay, anaphoric center, then, because each one of these occurrences is an anaphora. The anaphoric center has to be midway. All right, but if it's an even number, midway has to be a pair. So you got one, two, three, four on the right, and one, two, three, four on the left. So the anaphoric center of the anaphora for harlot or woman is in verses 6 through 7. Same thing for all the occurrences of the word to see. Horao. And these are different, you know, parts, you know, different expressions of the word horao in different tenses and stuff. Okay? So how many of those are there? One, two, three, four, five, six. Seven, eight, nine. Okay, well then that means one, two, three, four. The fifth one is the center. And you'll notice that I've shaded the centers. Okay, and then what's the other main repeated word? It could be a phrase, but in this case it's just a word. Beast. Here's the word for beast. Terion. 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 Depends on how you want to pronounce it. Okay, well, there's one, two, three, four. Ooh, 12 million one verse. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, so we're going one, two, three, four, and the fifth one. Oh, that's the same as the number of C verses. Because you got four on the left and four on the right. So we got nine of these. We got nine of these. Oops, oops, oops. Nine of these, all the way back to the top, please. Okay, we got nine and nine, but we got ten for the woman. What does that matter? I don't know. What I do know is that now you found the center for each pattern of repetition, like rhythm, like a beat. Ba bum, ba bum, ba bum, ba bum, ba bum, ba bum. Ba bum 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 ba bum. Okay, and anybody who does music and I don't can tell you where the center of that music is. It's the same thing. Okay, now, so what happened? Well, C, the center of it's in verse eight at the end of verse eight, and B, the center of it's in verse eleven, and. Uh, for a woman, the center of it is verses 6 and 7. So what do we find out? That somehow, the get this, the center of history. 
the center of history. That means that everything coming in is the has sort of like a, a like a singularity in physics or a core. And everything that happens is from that center is the main impetus, the main cause of what comes out. Now in Greek drama that's what they're always looking for. When you see Day of the Lord, that's a center. Okay? That's an anaphoric center. Everything, all history prior to the Day of the Lord, the purpose for all history prior to the Day of the Lord was to get to the Day of the Lord. And everything that happens after the Day of the Lord is due to the Day of the Lord. Okay? So we're doing the same kind of thing. It's like, it's either a goal or a cause or a center like in essence. Okay? So, 6 through 8, because it's 6 and 7 and 8, those are really claws. Okay, plus you got 8 here. So if we went 6 through 8, that's pretty much the center with all the words in it. Alright, so now let's look at that. This is to determine, this is like God telling you what's the cause of history. The whole panorama. Alright, so what's this? Verse 6. Oh, here's what happened. Constantine had died right here in the middle of abominations. That's what the word means. Delugmaton. That's from Daniel 9. Daniel 7. Uh, Daniel 7? No. Daniel 9. Daniel 9, 27. Okay. Constantine's not getting a good report card from God. Okay. Because he's dying at ma, and I, that, that, I can make a lot of jokes about what that word means, but it's just a syllable here. He's dying in the middle of abominations. That's not a good report card from God. He has three sons at that point. One of them, this guy, decides that he's angry with his brother, this guy, over the definition of God. So this guy starts up a war with this guy three years after his dad died. And of course, during those same three years, they killed all of their other, bro not necessarily brothers, but maybe cousins, anybody male who could take power from them. They were not good people. Do you get that? Constantine himself, the guy that's dying here in the middle of abominations, he killed one of his other sons, he had another son, and his wife and his brother-in-law and of course he justified it to himself how justified he was i don't know but that doesn't sound good does it okay so that's our start coming into verse six which is our center of history the backstop is one brother tried to kill another brother only what happened is while this guy's on his way to kill this guy this guy dies so this guy's still alive and there's one other brother that's going to start in our story here. So our center of history starts right here in 340 AD. That's 341, Chi. I hope you're getting the joke there. Because Chi is short for Kaiser, king. And Constance is now Kaiser, over what Constantine II's territory had been because he died in 340. So in 341, there's only two brothers, Constans in the west and Constantius II in the east. Well, the eastern territories were always richer and bigger and all this other good stuff. So Constans had the west. But eventually, they don't get along so well either. Now, I don't remember why Constans dies by the end of this clause. Metus, Metusan, drunk. That might be some kind of right comment on how he dies. I haven't looked that up. Usually it is. It's making some kind of comment about the drunkenness of the kingdoms. How they're drunk with 
lust, they're drunk with the woman. And I don't mean a literal woman, I mean religion. And they were. Both of them were excessively religious of different poles, depending on what day it was. So they were drunk with religion. And I don't know, know, I don't remember if Constans was getting ready to war against Constantius in the east or what was going on. But he dies in 350. And this is some kind of witty comment, nasty too, about the two brothers and what they controlled in Rome. Now, that's part of the center of history. In other words, if you want to figure out where history is going, Think of it like an orbit of a planet. Again, back to physics. What makes a planet stay around a center? Everything revolves around the center. Okay? Here, the center of history starts going by the rather mechanical procedure of finding all the anaphora and what is each anaphora's center. And then you look at all of them and say, okay, well, what's like almost like the average? Where do most of the most of the centers fit? Well, it's pretty obvious to say six, seven, and eight. Especially since eight is included by here. Alright? Same verse. Not same word order. Okay. So then it's starting with the two remaining brothers in 340 AD. And then it ends, verse 8 ends, right here. See, here's verse 8. And it's kind of a pregnant verse because you got, it, it's like bookended. Here we got the beast which you saw. And then this isn't John seeing anymore. This is the people who are wondering after the beast. And if you've seen my previous videos over the last couple of weeks, I've been focusing on books I found to talk about the preoccupation with the world and that's what's going on here because this in 340 is in what we call now Istanbul but they didn't call it that they called it New Rome and the Russians today even though they're in Russia and quite some distance from Istanbul they don't call them they in their minds their Russian is a part of their name they think of themselves as the third Rome. That when Istanbul, when Constantinople fell to the Muslims in 1453, the Russians believed they inherited it. Now at the time that it fell, that there's some debate as to whether the Russians immediately started thinking that. But within a hundred years they did. And it's been going on ever since. And it's real relevant now because that's where history is going back toward reviving Rome, which is exactly what was going on in 340. So now we're saying, oh, we're still circling around the center of Rome. Okay? Now you've heard this all your life, the revived Roman Empire. But when you stop to think about it, it's like, well, that doesn't make any sense. Well, yeah, it does. At least right now. Because that's where the American Christians and the Russian Christians are fitting together. They want to revive Rome. And here we got confirmation. Not simply because we've heard it a thousand times. But we got confirmation from these anaphoric centers. Which is, you know, a little slightly more objective approach. Okay, this is the center starting in 340 AD. And then the other, the other end of the center itself is a kind of center because we've got beast seeing seeing beast so you got seeing in the middle and beast on either end and you say well that doesn't mean anything yeah it does because in greek the word order doesn't have to be like this the meaning does not change if i change the word order nuances might change but for them to specifically balance it like this is telling you something okay it's telling you something about the center all these, all these occurrences of the words could have been different, but they're not. And Paul was doing the same thing, and Paul too centered Ephesians 1 on Constantine. Okay? In his case, he was centering it on Severus 
Alexander Severus, Septimius Severus, rather, and Constantine. And he was basically, his anaphoric centers were flowing from about 212, 217 A.D. to 330 A.D. That was his center for the whole 490 period that he was writing about. This is much longer, but it's still centering at Constantine. Actually, I pray Constantine. Constantine died right here. This is with his sons. The aftermath of what Constantine created with new Rome. Okay, and then the bookend, the center, ends here. And what's so significant about that? What's significant about that is one of the, one of the most, um, what do you want to call it? One of the most micromanaging Christian emperors to ever live, and he gets way too much favorable press, is Justinian. He was anti-Semitic. He was, you know, charismatic, I suppose you could say. But he decided that it was his job to tell the church everything that they could, they could, if they wanted to change the linens, they would have to get his approval. He was the Donald Trump of his day, except he was smarter and, what do you want to call it, more cultured. But he was just as much of a, a despot. He told the church what to do. So whatever they thought they were, his command, especially right in here, was required for anything about the church. I think he called it the third chapter. 553 is here you want to look up. Okay, and you, and you, you can hear, read about it here. And I think that that's the Wikipedia link and that's the Roman Emperor's link. But that's the distinguishing feature of Justinian. So the bookend is at the aftermath of Constantine, ending just before, because this is when Justin dies, just before Justinian, his nephew, takes power. And he takes power right here. Again, Kai. Instead of Kaiser, it's Kai. Justinian dies here. And of course, when one emperor dies, a new emperor comes to power. Kai, you were Kaiser, but now you're just a you're just a connecting conjunction. See, God's really spitting on them. Now, what makes this bookend here at when Justin dies? And that's what I didn't understand for a long time. Well, the big deal was is that they're all during this time, from here to the end of here. They were fighting back and forth over the definition of God. And over the definition of whether Western Rome or Eastern Rome should be the, the Rome of the clerics that you listen to. Okay? It was a constant, it was like Democrats and Republicans, only far nastier. I know it's hard to believe right now, but. Life in the past was a lot nastier than what we're going through now. When Just, Justin was the guy, basically, the argument was between one idea of God and another idea of God. And with Justin, it finally switched. Okay? One side really won the more. Okay? It still wasn't completely over. But like the superiority came and I don't want to get into the details of it because I just want you to see the, the history so God is basically saying that everything that happens in history this pattern from verse 6 to verse 8 is going to just keep playing over and over and over just like Revelation not Revelation um, Daniel 9.26 says Groundhog Day Wars and rumors of wars until I come. Okay, fine, but what kind of wars? Religious wars. What kind of wars? Trying to revive Rome. Because that was what Justin was trying to do. Constantine tried to do it, and his sons fought and fought and fought, and basically what happened is, is Western Rome fell. Okay? Right here. So there was only Byzantium left. And so then there was sitting there trying to figure out 
Well, do we go back to Western Rome and take it over? And they tried putting puppy kings there and blah, 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 blah. And they finally decide, no, we're just the new Rome. And this is where that decision ended up getting made. They broke with the West. Now, Justinian, when he comes to power the following year, he has ambitions of taking over the West. But the break occurred under Justin. And it was all be due to religion. So this is a wash, rinse, repeat pattern of history. Now that's your introduction. We will be doing... <coughs> we'll be coming back to this for more Quantum Bible in later episodes. Peace out.